are all doing fine uh, and so I hope nobody has any questions on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we will start with uh, barrier method today. Uh, and I want to solve this problem. I want to minimize f of x such that gx is less than or equal to zero or gj of x is less than or equal to zero for all j in one R and x is in some set x. Okay, x is a subset of Rn. And we need to make some assumptions here. So the assumptions are x is closed I am going to define the set capital S as the set of x and x such that gj of x is strictly less than 0 for all j in 1 to r. So assumption 2 is S is non-empty and assumption 3 is for every X in the set capital X with GX is less than or equal to 0, there exists a sequence XK in capital S such that xk converges to x star. <coughs> How can s ever be empty? How can s ever be empty? Uh, so, uh, you could have two inequality constraints that meet only at one point, in which case, yeah. Okay, so S is known as, uh, S would be what would be a relative interior uh, of the set of all feasible points, okay? But the concept of relative interior is a little bit more complicated, um, so I don't want to introduce it in class. So I just introduced the notation. So you want S to be non-empty, you want X to be closed, and you want uh, every feasible point can be approached by a sequence in S, okay? And that's the most important point. Um, so you can't have a situation where you have a set, your x is a set like this and then a point, an isolated point somewhere else uh, because, and all of them are feasible because if this is the case, it's a closed set, right? But this point cannot be approached by a sequence within S because S will be only the interior of this particular set. <coughs> So that's the, that's the problem. So you want to make sure that every point in X can be approached by a sequence within S. Any questions with that? Yes. 
why is it important to state it that way? Like why, because, correct me if I'm wrong, but what that's saying is that if capital X is the set of feasible points, mm -hmm. then <coughs> what that statement is saying is that every feasible point is also in S. So why is it important that we need a sequence in S? Okay, so why do we need a sequence? So remember in that, that so remember the affine scaling method where we went through the interior of the set to get converse to the optimal point which might be at the boundary. So we will have a similar situation here. Let's say this is the optimal solution and this is at the boundary. But the way we will construct the barrier which goes to infinity as soon as you hit the boundary, I mean as soon as you get closer to the boundary, it will escape to infinity. So you will always be within the interior of the set, right? And now if the interior, if, so now you get a sequence which is in the set capital S, right? And you are trying to approach the boundary, but then you will never be able to approach this point because it's outside of the set S. So there is a distance between the set S and the optimal point. So you want to avoid those situations. And that's why you need to make these assumptions, okay? So, so what that is saying then is that the S is a set such that the limit behavior on that set includes all these points. Right, okay. yes. Um, yeah. But these conditions don't actually imply connectedness. No, they don't require connectedness. Yeah, I mean this is no, not a connected set. Now this, so this is your X, and then your S would be things here and maybe things here, and so you can approach all the boundary points by a sequence within the set S. Okay. Of course, in reality or in in practice, your problems might have more structure than all these pathological cases that we are discussing. <coughs> so they may never kick in, but we need to study them nonetheless. Okay, so these are the three assumptions we will be making. <coughs> then we define a barrier function, uh, B of X, it's called the barrier function and it's it could be defined in multiple ways so you have logarithmic barrier function so then b of x is negative summation j equals 1 to r log of negative gj of x you could have inverse barrier summation j equals 1 to r, 1 over negative gj of x. Okay, one of the questions in your assignment is to show that if gj's are all convex functions, then these two barrier functions are also convex, yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. This should be just x because you pick an x in x with gx less than zero then you want the sequence. There, exi there should be a sequence in S that converges to this feasible point. That makes sense, and then, but doesn't that, isn't the definition of S being close? No, so, um, so X being close doesn't mean it's connected, right? So you could have isolated points which still satisfy, so you would have isolated points in X, uh, which will be at the boundary, and so you just want to remove those pathological conditions by making this assumption. Y you know, the problem is when you're doing some sort of mathematical analysis, you want to make sure that your assumptions are airtight, okay? 
so okay so what's the algorithm uh, the algorithm is I am going to compute x k star by computing the argument of f of x plus epsilon k b, b of x where x is in capital X. Okay, and epsilon k is a is a decreasing sequence, it converges to zero. Epsilon k plus one is less than epsilon k is less than So it's a decreasing sequence and at every point of time we solve this minimization problem to compute can do that, why not? Uh, okay, so, so let me go back. So, I pick a value of epsilon k and I compute x k star. Then I reduce the value of epsilon k plus one. Why can't I use x k star to feed into the next optimization problem? See, the thing is, th there are two things. One is, uh, you're not required to do that, okay? You can keep initializing with a different feed, it's just going to take insanely longer time uh, to solve the problem. So if you want to do it more efficiently, you just use the previous solution as a seed to the next iterate, and that will convert to the solution faster. And I'm going to talk about linear programming in a bit where we do exactly that. In fact, we don't even end up solving this minimization problem, we just solve it approximately and then move on. Okay, and then it has some convergence properties that will take several classes to go over, but I'll just glance over the entire like theorem so that you know what's happening in that particular example. Okay, so typically you would take epsilon k plus 1 as 0 0.2 epsilon k and you will run this algorithm again and again and eventually, and by the way you will always get a sequence, you, your xk star would always be in capital S. If you solve this problem because bx goes to infinity when you get closer to the boundary of the feasible form. So you will get xk star in S and then the fact is xk star converges to x star as Capital S in order to get to the optimal point, which could be at the boundary. 
But because of the third assumption, so because of the second assumption, we will be able to solve the optimization problem at every time here. And because of the third assumption, we will be able to convert to the optimal point x star as k goes through. Okay, so that's why it's called it's the barrier method uh, sits within the class of interior point method where you always reside in the interior of the set and then converts to the optimal point as time goes. We have studied one interior method. Uh, so in the manifolds of optimization method, you always wear at the boundary and then you converge to the optimal point. In the affine scaling method, you were always inside the set and then you converge to the optimal point from within the set. And barrier method is also an interior point method which works by constructing a barrier function which goes to infinity at the boundary of the set. Now you would ask the question, how do you solve this problem, right? So of course if x is convex, then you have conditional gradient method, you have gradient projection method, you have, um, in the case of linear programming, we'll talk about Lagrange multiplier method, uh, like the, you can use Lagrange multiplier to get the optimization. Okay, so you don't have to, so, like most of the optimization algorithms we have studied so far, we have this big optimization problem to solve. We construct intermediate sequence of optimization problems that if you solve it, you convert to the optimal system, just like many other algorithms that we have studied until now. Okay, any questions so far on the barrier method? Yes. You won't find the solution, but you will find an approximately optimal solution. So, so let's say I fix epsilon to be 0 0.1, right? I mean, of course, it will be good to fix epsilon to be 10, and then 1, or 2, and then 1, and then 1, 0 0.5, and then 0 0.2. So you are you're solving a sequence of optimization problem, but then you can argue that, okay, I'm at the very beginning, I'm going to pick epsilon to be very, very small numbers, and then I'll run this algorithm. Uh, I think the problem with that kind of algorithm is that you don't, you don't reach an optimal point quite efficiently. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about it in the context of linear programming. So, uh, a specific algorithm might make more sense. Okay. No, you can't go out of the set, right? Because if you pick, uh, if you pick epsilon k to be uh, ten, yeah. If you pick epsilon k to be sufficiently large then you are essentially not minimizing this function, you are minimizing barrier function. And essentially you will end up minimizing the barrier function over the set capital X. That would take me to the, to the boundary of the set. Not the boundary, right? It will be interior of the set. Yeah, because that, that epsilon is being, if epsilon is big, you fatten the boundary, right? Yeah, you are backing away from the boundary. You are going to the interior of the set. Okay, let me start the discussion on linear programming and then for the context of linear programming you can ask me the same questions and it will make more sense there. Yes. Yes. That's right. Your constraint is not acting, which is this inequality constraint is not acting, right? But you're still, since epsilon is very small, uh, you're not distorting the function a lot. 
except when you are extremely close to the boundary. Now your solution is at the boundary, let's say your solution was here, right? And you pick epsilon to be 0 0.001, right? Then your x epsilon star would be somewhere here, right? So it's close to the optimal solution x star, right? Uh, but, well, it is not at the boundary. Right? It is in the interior of the cell. And then, of course, if you change the value of epsilon and give this as the initial condition to solve the next set of optimization problems, you might get closer to x star. And eventually, the the result is that xk converges to x star. So eventually, you will be as close to x star as you want. And remember, I mentioned it in the previous class that in optimization algorithms, you don't want to converge to the optimal point. You want to get as close to the optimal point as is possible within a limited time. Okay. okay. Perfect. So let's do linear programming with linear constraints and see what the solution looks like. Or, or rather what the algorithm looks like. Uh, and the, the, there is a history to this particular algorithm. Uh, it was proposed by a researcher at Bell Labs, uh, Narendra Karmarkar, and he proposed this. And remember, 1980s, so uh, a fine scaling method was proposed in 1967. So this was, what, 17 years after the affine scaling method. Affine scaling was probably the first uh, one of the famous interior point method at that time for linear programming. So, um, so he came up with a completely new algorithm which had much better theoretical properties uh, than existing algorithms at that time. Oh, and by the way, Bell Labs um, patented this algorithm at that time in 1984 and nobody used it for 17 years and after 17 years, some of you may know the patent basically uh, so, there is no intellectual property rights after 17 or whatever, 18 years. Um, and so after that, this algorithm became, uh, it came into public domain, so anyone could use it without actually giving a royalty to Bell Labs. And, and yeah, and so now everyone can use it uh, without having to worry about IP rights. Um, but yeah, but, but, but Bell Labs thought that they would be able to make a lot of money out of this algorithm, but they couldn't. <laughs> so that was the risk they took. So then my x is, I want to minimize C transpose x as that x is greater than or equal to 0, and Ax is equal to b. OK? Uh, you may not know, but this is kind of a standard form of a linear program. Uh, Whenever I get time, I'll tell you why this is a standard form, but most linear programs can be written down as a linear program with this particular form. So I now have to define the set capital X and I need to define GJ of X. So let's do that. So GJ of X is equal to XJ and my capital X is x such that ax is equal to b, or I should say x in Rn. Okay, and so now I have uh, the problem in exactly the same format as we had for the barrier method, and I'm going to pick the log barrier function here. I have to have negative sign. So remember, gj of x is less than or equal to 0, so I need to have a negative sign here. So negative xj. And so my barrier function, p of x is negative i equals 1 to m log of xi. And I'm going to define f epsilon of x as fx plus epsilon of x. No, minus epsilon. And 
then my set capital S is x in our n such that ax equals to b x is greater than 0. I want to draw the set again. So this is my set. When epsilon is equal to infinity, then you are essentially minimizing the negative v of x over the set capital X. So your minimum of f epsilon x is the same as minimizing negative bx x over capital X. Okay. And so this would be your x star infinity which will be interior of the set. That will be the solution to this particular problem. Okay, so there was a question in the class somebody asked, when epsilon is large, what happens? Well, when epsilon is large, you are essentially trying to solve this optimization problem and you get to a solution x star infinity which is just a point in the interior of the set it's not at the boundary okay. now as you keep re reducing the value of epsilon and let me draw this as uh, x star this would be your x star for let's say this is the x star for the linear programming problem so as you reduce the value of epsilon and you solve this minimization problem You are essentially trying to, you get a sequence of point x star epsilon, which might look something like this, and this is known as central path x star epsilon. So when epsilon is infinity, you are giving a lot of weight to the px and in comparison f of x gets zero weight. So you can rewrite this as epsilon f of x over epsilon minus p of x. So when epsilon is very very large, this part goes to zero, only this part So the solution remains the same. I'm not saying that the value will be the same, but the solution x star would remain the same. No, not really. So, okay. So let's let me draw. Let let's say my my interval is zero one. And the barrier function is something like this. So when epsilon is very, very large, no matter what the function is, let's say the function looks something like this. The function gets, when epsilon is very, very large, the function is almost negligible. If you make as a minimum, here, that would be x star infinity. Right. 
Yeah. You are minimizing the function over x. Uh, your point x star f, x star infinity will always be in the set capital S. Set capital S capital. S. Okay, so your x will have strictly positive element, and you will be on this hyperplane. Okay. okay, and then as you change the value of epsilon, so for epsilon equals zero. You end up solving the original optimization problem. Okay. So when epsilon is equal to zero, you are at x star. So this would be epsilon equals to zero. And then you are essentially tracing a path uh, within the set, within the interior of the set, or within the set capital S, for varying so, so and, and that's called the central path. This would be epsilon equals to thousand. Epsilon equals to 100. Epsilon equals to 150. Epsilon equals to 10, and so on. Okay, so you're tracing a path, and this is known as a central path. I don't mean to say that you are dropping those constraints. How do I? Yeah, so I don't want to mean that you are dropping the constraint when epsilon is equal to zero. How do I write that? When epsilon is equal to zero, I don't want to minimize epsilon x. You know, I'm, I'm still talking about a limiting behavior, so I'm not dropping the constraint, but how do I, how do I ensure that I'm not dropping the constraint? Let's, let's take that question a little bit later, okay? Um, you see there's a continuity in this line, okay? So you won't be jumping from this point to some other point in the set. Okay, but that's not a, that, that's an intuitive answer. That's not a rigorous answer. So let me make it rigorous a little bit later. Okay, I'll get back to it in some time. So the idea is, uh, okay, the idea of the barrier method was every time I change the value of epsilon, I have to converse to x star epsilon and then change the value of epsilon to something else and then converse to x star epsilon and so on. Um, but the new idea, a more efficient idea, is follow the central path approximately. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So here is my x star infinity, here is my x star, here is the central path. I will start from some point x naught in the set. I will converge, run some Newton's iteration to converge closer to the central path. And then I am just going to run a couple of Newton's iteration. So every time I reduce the value of epsilon, I don't I don't run many many steps of Newton's iteration. I'll run a few steps of Newton's iteration, 
to converge to this point, no, not to converge, but to get to this point. So I'm still close to the central path, and then change the value of epsilon, and again run Newton's iteration, and I come closer to the central path, and then keep doing the same thing again and again. So initially, you have to take several steps to get closer to the central path. But after the initial time, you are only going to take a few Newton iteration, um, and then change the value of epsilon, and then take a few Newton's iteration, change the value of epsilon, take few Newton's iteration, change the value of epsilon, and so on. Okay, So you're not exactly tracing the central path as was required in the barrier method, but you are going to be approximately, you're going to be close to the central path, and eventually you will converge to X star. And this method is theoretically the most efficient method to solve a linear program, okay? And theoretically, I will talk about uh, some practical implementation issues uh, as given in the book. Any question so far? Yes? How do you see the duration you're decreasing epsilon? Yes, you're decreasing epsilon. So, um, oh, yeah, okay. okay. So for instance, epsilon 10 would be epsilon 9 over 5. OK, so you take one fifth of. Oh, yeah, I was going to make my other part of that question was, like, is there a set number of times you take an iteration before you change epsilon? Yes, so in the algorithm that I'm going to talk about, you take only one Newton step at every point of time. OK, only one. We'll talk about it. There are multiple ways to do it. Okay. So there is a trade-off. So remember, there are two things you are controlling. One is epsilon, how how much to reduce the epsilon by, and how many newton step to take. Okay. What's the trade-off? You can have you can change your epsilon by a little bit, and take only one newton step, or you can reduce your epsilon by a big number, and take multiple newton step. Okay. And they both have different theoretical guarantees. OK. So what's the algorithm? Uh, let me keep this part. I want to solve the following problem. So remember, you're in the conditional gradient method or solving optimization problems of this type, we had this update equation, x tilde equals x plus alpha x bar minus x. And there was a way to find x bar. In the conditional gradient method, we solved a linear program. In the case of gradient projection method, you did some projection in order to find x bar. So we'll do the same thing. And we'll get x bar to be argmin of gradient f epsilon x transpose z minus x plus 1 over 2. Okay. So I'm, I'm standing at x. I'm standing at some point x here. I have to take one Newton step. I need to find this x bar so that I can take, take a Newton step in the direction x bar minus x. How do I find x bar? Well, I solve this minimization problem. OK. And so uh, in, the, in the definition of x bar, <coughs> x is fixed, is that correct? Yes, x is fixed. x is your point at which you're standing now. x bar is where you would want to go, right? Um, but of course, you will only go by picking an appropriate value of epsilon. So you won't go all the way to x bar, but you will go in the direction of x bar. So what is the 
first derivative of f and the second derivative of f. So let me erase this part. So gradient of f at x is c minus epsilon 1 by x1, 1 by xn. Okay, and the second derivative of the function f epsilon is 1 over x1 square, 1 over xn square, 0, 0. Okay, so it's a diagonal matrix. The second derivative is a diagonal matrix. Oh, there is an epsilon multiplicative factor outside of this matrix. Okay, so in order to ease the notation, I am going to define the capital set, capital X as diagonal X. Okay, don't confuse this X with the set X. Okay, this is just capital X. Okay. Now, I remember, uh, you know, you may recall that we have solved this kind of optimization problem several times in the course of this class, this, uh, this particular course. Uh, in the course of this course, that doesn't sound good, okay. But, but you all know that this optimization problem can be solved by hand, and what's the solution? My x bar is x minus 1 over epsilon x capital X square c minus epsilon 1 over x1 1 over xn minus a transpose lambda and lambda is given by a x square a transpose inverse A x square C minus epsilon 1 by x1, 1 by xn. Okay. This is the optimization problem and this is the solution to this problem. Okay. How do you get how do you get from this optimization problem to this solution? Anyone remembers? Lagrange multiplier theorem, right? So the second derivative is positive. So if you think of this as a function of z, the second derivative of this function is exactly this number, that this matrix, and this matrix is positive definite because each of these xi's are strictly positive. You are in the interior of the set capital S, so all these values are positive, so you are, so you have a positive definite matrix, so you can apply uh, the, so the second order sufficiency conditions are satisfied for the Lagrange multiplier theorem and then you can use Lagrange multiplier theorem to find the optimal Lagrange multiplier and the solution to the 
optimization problem. Okay, this is an equality constraint problem, so solving it is uh, quite simple. The other thing I want you to note is, or maybe you can note it when you go back home, is that in the entire expression, this entire expression looks exactly the same as a fine scaling method, except for this epsilon one over x one term. So if you erase this term here, this term here, this algorithm is exactly the same algorithm as the affine scaling method. Okay, because there also, this matrix was taken to be the inverse of, inverse square of this particular matrix in the affine scaling method. So you can go look at the two algorithms side by side and you will see that there is not much difference except for this term here, okay? This term is extra in this particular algorithm. It wasn't there in the affine scaling method. Okay. Any questions so far? Yes. It might be a specific question, but uh, what if we set the epsilon uh, as a very small number uh -huh. and then run to this algorithm? Uh -huh. How did geometric uh, convergence occur? So, okay, so you start from, you want to pick an epsilon very small, so you want to converge to this point, and you start at this point x0. Then you have to take maybe multiple Newton step yes. to get closer to this point. So it's gonna be uh, less efficient than Using the large number, large number initial, is that correct? That's a good question. So his question is, if I pick an epsilon very small, I can run this Newton step or whatever this step is many, many times in order to get to this point. So is this going to be more efficient or should I pick a large value of epsilon? start from the same point, get closer to here, and then just take, just follow the central path approximately. Now, I'll give you a bad answer, okay? Uh, but hopefully you will appreciate it. So whenever you have an algorithm, there are two things that you want to check. One is the convergence property, and the other one is convergence property on the problem that you have, okay? So when you talk about convergence properties in general, you look at the worst instance of the problem, okay? So if I give you the worst optimization problem to solve, how much time it's going to take for you to solve that problem? This method, the one that you came up with, is not efficient. The second question is, given your problem, you have some problem in signal processing, you want to solve it using this method. Which algorithm would be most efficient will give you the solution very quickly. It could be the case that this solution might be faster than the solution, than the algorithm that we are going to talk about. Okay, so, so the bottom line is, if you are a PhD student, you want to follow the central path approximately. If you are a master student or an undergraduate student, you want to use this method. <laughs> okay, because as a PhD student, you need to prove that your algorithm convergence converges in these many steps, this much computational time. Okay, this is the complexity and all that stuff, which an undergraduate or a master student don't have to worry about. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, so that's that's the answer. <laughs> okay. So what's my, so I found x bar. I'm going to rewrite this 
whole solution in a short form. So your x bar is x minus capital XQ x comma epsilon, where Q x comma epsilon is given by x c minus a transpose lambda over epsilon minus 1 1 1 1 1. Okay, so this is a uh, another way to write the same solution. So what's the descent direction now in this notation? So x bar minus x is just x multiplied, capital X multiplied by this vector q of x comma epsilon. So my descent direction d, where do I write it? Everything is full of equations. Okay, so I'm going to write it here. D is x bar minus x, that's negative x. Negative x q x comma epsilon. So that's, uh, so you get the value, that you get this, this direction in which you want to go by just looking at this capital X multiplied by Q X comma Epsilon. Uh, so capital X is easy to compute. Q of X comma Epsilon is just uh, finding out this value of Lambda and then substituting it here and getting the value of Q X Epsilon. So all of this is computationally efficient, okay? Not many, uh, there's nothing fancy that you have to do here in order to solve this, in order to get the descent direction D. The other thing I want you to note is fact. Okay, I'm going to, I have to erase something now. Uh, the other fact that you will note is Q of X comma Epsilon is equal to zero if and only if X equal to X star Epsilon. Okay, so Q of X, of X epsilon is a vector and this vector will be equal to zero if you are at the central path. Okay, so you, you pick epsilon equals 50. If you are at this point, which corresponds to X star 50, then your Q of X epsilon is going to be equal to zero. What does that mean? If you're away from the central path, your Q of X epsilon is going to be non-negative, not non-negative, sorry. Q is a vector, so it will be some non-zero vector, and you can take the norm of Q, and that will be a strictly positive number. So in other words, away from central path, norm of Q X comma epsilon is greater than zero. And that's the key. That's the key because if I ask you how close or far away from the central path you are, the norm of this vector gives you an idea. It doesn't give you exact value. Okay, you are this far from the central path. But it gives you an idea that you are close or you are far away from the central path. Okay, and that's what we want. We don't want to know the exact distance. We just want to know an approximate idea of how close or far away from the central path you are. Okay? So that's the key. Yes? So is that specifically telling me how far away I am from the whole path or is it telling me how far away I am uh, from that particular x epsilon. Yeah, okay. yeah. So uh, the question is, 
if, okay, great, well, let's say for some epsilon, that guy's really small. Yes. Well, if I reduce epsilon, is, gonna, is it still going to be small? No, it won't. It will be large, right? And then you will run Newton's iteration until this number becomes small. Then you reduce the value of epsilon, and then so on. Okay, so in order to understand, uh, so I'm not going to, oh, I'm already, okay, it's, it's, it's done, so class is done. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how, the central, how this method works. This is the fact that I wanted to cover in this class, so we'll take it up from there in the next class. Thank you.